Hi, good evening to everyone. This is Kenya Rothman, the author and founder of the Child Support Hustle. And um, I want to talk to you all about the Turner versus Rogers decision, kind of. Um, they did a final rule, the final register back in December 2016. I'm sorry. I still get nervous when I come on live. And um, I wanted to discuss, go over some of the stuff that was in that, the final register, the final uh, rule in New York. I got a document that showed, and it's the first time I received any documents, any proof that a state or a jurisdiction was actually implementing or sent anything out to the child support agencies and the judicial system, um, the judicial agencies about how to handle these child support cases when it came to contempt of court and um, how to uh, follow the guidelines. So I've never received anything to show. And as far as I'm concerned, no states have implemented the rules that have come out of Turner versus Rogers, um, the final rule, the register, anything like that. So. New York has, even though New York is still trying to lock, I know one parent up for sure, for contempt of court when they have clearly shown that they did not have the ability to pay, do not have the ability to pay, and that is still an issue that's going on right now. So um, that's why I want to go over this again, and I can't stress it enough because states are supposed to be following these guidelines, and we learned about this after Turner. Um, and they're still violating the Supreme Court ruling. So, and please bear with me. It's a lot of information, but it's all important. Well, I think everything that we share here is important. So if I go too fast or if you have any questions, just know that I put in the description here a link to everything I'm going to talk about. There's a link to uh, what I'm talking about in the description and I also included the federal the DOJ when they put out that letter about arresting people and suspending licenses back in 2016 December 2016 um, I think that's when but the, the the link is in the letter you can't find it just on the internet anymore they took it down because it was rescinded uh, under this administration but there are also links in there that are case law they're already there so they didn't overturn that they just rescinded the letter so I wanted to point that out and if you haven't seen the letter it's a, a link so you can get it okay and oh yes yeah, somebody told me to always say this please like and share this video this live feed please <clears throat> okay I'm gonna get started with just going over the final rule um, that came out of the Department of Health and Human Services, who is the overseer of the Office of Child Support Enforcement, who oversees the state and local child support agencies. And this is uh, in reference to CFR C4, the enforcement of support obligations, civil contempt, which can be found in the final rule. This is the title of the final rule, flexibility, efficiency, and modernization in child support enforcement programs. Okay, since the federal agency is responsible for finding an Funding and oversight. Oversight is questionable, of course. The Office of Child Support Enforcement has an interest in ensuring that one, constitutional principles articulated in the U.S. Supreme Court decision in Turner versus Rogers are carried out in the child support programs. Child support outcomes, case outcomes, are just and comply with due process. Due process is so important, and I'm going to discuss that a little bit more. Um, because there's been a question that has come up about this whole Turner versus Rogers and who the, who the rules and due process apply to. So I'm going to come back to that. And finally, enforcement, they are, they have an interest in ensuring that enforcement proceedings are cost effective. You know, they're about their money and in the best interest of the child. Funny that they put cost effective before they put in the best interest of the child. Not funny to us that know. But if you don't know, now you know. The mighty dollar, the bottom line, is what's important uh, to the child support enforcement agencies. The best interest of the child is last. Okay, and there's for there's so many instances and so many examples. I'm not going on this video discuss it, but 
I can if that's something y'all want to discuss. I have no problem discussing how the system is not designed for the best interest of the child or the family. Okay. So this final rule, it revised the uh, 45 CFR 303.6 C4, which established criteria the child support agencies must use to determine, to determine which cases to refer and how they prepare cases for civil contempt proceedings. Okay, the main goal is to increase, the main goal again is to increase consistent child support payments for children by ensuring that low income parents are not incarcerated unconstitutionally because they are poor and unable to comply with orders that do not reflect their ability to pay. And I said to increase consistent child support payments for children. I thought that was, you know, because we know that because child support program, the child support program is a welfare recovery program, more than 32 jurisdictions, I think it's up to 33 now, do not pass through or pay any child support collected for a family receiving welfare benefits, zero. And if they do, if the states do pass through any money, it's $50 up to $200 for two or more children, but it just depends on what jurisdiction you're in. California is now trying to pass a bill to raise the amount of money passed through to the TANF and Medicaid families. Some places, you, if you get food stamps, you have to sign over your rights to child support. So um, that's one of the, the criteria for this uh, final rule. Second, the final rule is intended to reduce the routine use of costly and often ineffective contempt proceedings and increase case investigation and more cost-effective collection efforts. Again, they're always going to try to save their money, and it's their money. It's not your money, okay? Um, please like and share this video. I re greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so the, the section 30304, the final rule, requires that the state child support agency requires that the agency to establish procedure for civil contempt petitions. Before filing a civil contempt action that can result in the non-custodial parent being incarcerated, states must ensure that the child support agency has screened the case to determine whether the facts support the finding that the non-custodial parent has the actual and present ability to pay or to comply with the order. If they don't have the ability to pay, they cannot comply with the order. Therefore, they cannot and should not be held in contempt and be faced with jail. Okay, They must provide the court with information regarding the non-custodial parent's ability to pay or otherwise comply with the order to help the court make a factual determination. They're supposed to go on facts when they try to hold somebody in contempt of court. This is supposed to be all fact-based, but instead, the issue warrants on base, based on old income with somebody used to make. They're not modifying, uh, processing the modifications in a timely manner. They're denying modifications when the criteria has been met by the non-custodial parent. Therefore, if they don't modify, the arrears continue to accumulate. Then next thing you know, they're in front of a judge about to be arrested. Now, prior to going to court, the state must give clear notice to the non-custodial parent that his or her ability to pay constitutes the critical question in the civil contempt action. You know what, guys? I always have this issue. I know you guys are I'm probably getting some comments, but I don't know how to that gonna work this thing to see if see what's going on. I hate that. I might have to call my son in here. Uh, shoot. Uh, okay. So the final rule provides, I see the likes and stuff. I just don't see the comments. So I'm sorry, guys. I want to say hi to you guys. So I'm just going to stop right now until maybe he'll poke his head in here because I don't want to put you guys on hold. I got a lot of information to go over. And um, let me see. It's always something when I get on here. It's either too dark or I don't know how to do this. I'm just going to train myself how to work all of this one day. We'll see. Okay, so the final rule provides state child support agencies with the guide for conduction of constitutionally acceptable proceedings. Okay, the final rule will, this is what it's supposed to do, reduce the risk of erroneous deprivation, deprivation of the non-custodial parent's liberty without imposing significant fiscal or administrative burden on the state. Okay, the states have that have reduced their 
over reliance on contempt proceedings have found that they increase collections and reduce costs at the same time, bottom line dollar. There is no evidence that the routine use of contempt proceedings improves collection rates or consistent support payments to the family. So that's not even, it, it, it serves no purpose when you look at the bottom line to incarcerate a parent that can't afford to pay. And they come out with a felony, they can't work with a felony, um, or it's harder for them to get a job with the felony. If you don't have the money, incarcerating them, uh, incarcerating your parents is counterproductive. And we know that. And they're not supposed to do it, but they still do. Okay. Unfortunately, the states have considerable flexibility in implementing these provisions. I didn't see in the Turner versus Rogers case that they gave them leeway. I don't know if this is just something that the Office of Federal the Federal Office of Child Support Enforcement just put out. This is how they are uh, putting it out to the public, how they are rewriting what has been said so that we don't know exactly or we don't follow or we don't expect what, this, what the Supreme Court has put out. That's how I'm looking at it because I've been over this stuff back and forth, up and down, and I don't see where this flexibility is, is, has been mentioned. Everybody's supposed to implement what the Supreme Court said, period. I don't see any flexibility in it, but I could be wrong. If you guys know, if you see something I don't, please send me a message. I, I, I want to learn. I'm always learning. So let me know if you see something different so I can correct myself and let everybody know that, and you know, I stand corrected. So <clears throat> because these states have flexibility, there are provisions. The provisions are based upon successful case practice in a number of states that conduct case-specific investigations and data analysis. The child support agencies will need to take steps to determine how to implement these changes in their states, which may include educate. I'm sorry, which may include educating and collaborating with the judiciary. With these kind of changes that came along with um, the final rule, why would they not be educating and collaborating with you with the judiciary anyway? Like, why is that a decision or a choice that they should be able to make? Okay. So I'm going to go on to New York. This is from the New York State of Opportunity Administrative. This is an administrative directive issued December 28th, 2018. And per the New York State of Oppor New York State of Opportunity Administrative Directive, the state is required to conduct a financial investigation and document the factual basis for the support obligation. Facts. The state must investigate the non-custodial parents' earning income and other evidence of ability to pay. They have to investigate. There is insufficient, if there's insufficient proof of income, imputation may be based on evidence and the ability to pay since the information, I mean, sorry, such as the information about the non-custodial parents' information. Now, I'm going to go back, I'm going to go into that because where they have it in this directive, it doesn't give you a full list of all the stuff that they're supposed to look at before they impute a non-custodial parent's income. Okay, so I'm going to get to that. State regulations concerning the establish it, establishment modification and enforcement of support obligation have been amended. So I'm not going to go over the modification part because they discuss, you know, how they're supposed to stop or lower, significantly lower child support if a parent is incarcerated for more than 180 days. That's around the country. That was uh, implemented under the Obama administration. Um, I'm not sure how many states are doing it. They don't keep number or track of that I've seen of how many that cases are modified based on somebody, a parent being incarcerated. But if you have somebody that's incarcerated that has a child support order and the agency hasn't reached out to them to stop or lower the child support amount while they're incarcerated, if it's more than 180 days, they uh, should contact the agency so that they don't come out with, you know, thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of dollars in debt. Okay, that's the law. That's the statute. Okay, so I'm not going to discuss the modification part of it. I'm just going to discuss the enforcement part because we're talking about contempt here. So um, the statute, the regulations have been amended to expand the information about new or modified orders of support to be maintained in the automated case record. They need to provide for a create creation of a record of the information and documents obtained 
uh, as a result of financial investigation conducted on the non-custodial parent. They require the local district child support enforcement unit to support and support units to petition to otherwise assist the recipient of services to modify the order of child support after financial investigation. I'm not going to go over all this, but if you get the picture, financial investigation, financial investigation, um, you're supposed to investigate all of this. I was told that a director in New York, one of the directors for the agency said that that was not their place or their job to investigate uh, these child support orders before they go before the judge for for contempt and that is their job their child support if there's one if they they're supposed to have documentation per their directive to say this case here's the financial information we've investigated yes he has a uh, million dollars in the Cayman Islands and he's willfully failing to pay so yeah, we need to hold him in contempt versus, oh my goodness, this guy broke his leg, hasn't been able to work. Oh, the judge says, oh, he's willfully failing to pay and let's lock him up. There's a big difference. Willfulness is the big difference, okay? The final rule provides that 4D agencies must establish criteria for filing civil contempt citations, uh, e.g. violation petitions, the criteria must include requirements that the child support agency, this is what they must do. Screen the case for information regarding the non-custodial parent's ability to pay or otherwise comply with the order. They have to be up, you guys have to be able to comply or you have not broken the law. Provide the court with such information regarding the non-custodial parent's ability to pay and otherwise comply with the order, which may assist the court in making a factual determination. They're supposed to base this on facts. Um, regarding the non-custodial parents' ability to pay the purge amount and comply with the purge conditions. They have to, you have to be able to comply. They can't say you have to pay X amount of dollars and they have the information from the investigation to say that you haven't worked in a year and you're disabled and then they're going to lock you up anyway. That's illegal. <clears throat> and they have to provide clear notice to the non-custodial parent that his or her ability to pay constitutes the critical question in the civil contempt action. Please like and share this page, please. I mean, this live video, I really appreciate it. I'm still going to try to figure out how to bring you guys on. I don't know. If y'all give me one second, I'm going to call my son so I can pull up the comments. Kids, hey, come here real quick, please. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Come here. Okay, because I can't, I want to, how, how do I get See the comments. Uh, you live already. Mm -hmm. This is my handsome son, guys. How y'all doing? He does all my computer stuff. Thankfully, he's here today. I can't see their comments, so I can't communicate. Uh, we're going to open in another tab. Hold on, guys, please. You want to see it on the screen, or you want to? I want to, yeah, I want to, you know how the comments you can see so I can talk. You know what happened there now? That's tough. That's tough. You on the other side now. You want to mute this? Hold on, guys. Did you see any of them? You ain't seen none of them. No, I ain't seen none of them. You can start from here and scroll down, and once you get to the end, boom. Are we live? Yeah, you live. You got people in here. Hi. Can y'all, why am I? You've been live for a minute. Oh, that's your, that's your delay, so don't pay attention to this. Pay attention to this. Oh, okay. These are all your comments since you've been live. I'm delayed, guys, so I can read your comments, but I'm delayed. I don't no, know what's No, you're not delayed at all. Oh. You live over here. Your comments just not popping. Hold on. Let me try something. I'm going to keep on going while he works on that, okay? So these three issues alone. Oh, I'm sorry. I got to get my place, guys. Yeah, don't, don't pay attention to this at all. Okay. Hi, Chuck. Got it. Hey, Ricky. Hi, Brandon. Thank you. Okay, so I'm not seeing myself, so 
that's on another screen. Hey, a Davino, Greg, hi guys, Brian. Okay, let me. Okay, I'm just gonna go. I'm just gonna go for it. Okay. So let me make sure I know where. I'm. Okay. So case conferencing. Okay, the final rule. This is distracting. The final rule. Thanks for hanging in there for me, guys. I really rather interact, and of course, I don't know where my phone is. Sorry. So, okay, the final rule provides the 4D agencies must establish criteria for filing civil contempt citations. The criteria must include requirements that the child support agency screen the case for information. Let me see the RSA. Okay. The state regulations concerning the establishment, modification, and enforcement of child support obligation have been amendment, amended to require that the child support enforcement unit review the case file to provide the court with any information from the case record, which may assist the court in making a factual determination regarding the non-custodial parent's ability to pay or otherwise comply with the order. Every petition to find the non-custodial parent in violation or motion to hold a non-custodial parent in contempt of, in, of an order to pay child support must provide such clear notice regarding the ability to pay consist, constituting the critical question in contempt proceedings, okay? So th they can obtain the information by case conferencing where all the parties involved meet with the child support unit they can interview with either or both parties. They have mandatory financial disclosures and questionnaires. That's their safeguarding. That's what they're supposed to be doing before they proceed with the, the uh, civil contempt proceedings. They need to obtain the information from the non-custodial parent or third party using subpoenas or requests pursuant to social, social services laws. If there's any insufficient, insufficient direct evidence of the non-custodial parent's income, or financial circumstances to use the measure for ability to pay, they can impute. And this is what I was talking about earlier in the video. There's criteria that they have to meet before they can impute your income. Prior to this ruling, they just went by where you lived, how old you were, and what you were supposed to be making. They did not take into consideration this, all of these criteria. And New York has put it in play. So they have to take in effect assets, residence, employment and earnings history, job skills, education, literacy, 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 yes, uh, age, health, criminal record, and other employment barriers, record of seeking work, job market conditions, the availability of employees, employers willing to hire the non-custodial parent. That's key because if they go to, if somebody's going to jail or has been in jail for contempt of court, and definitely, definitely, if they're a felon when they come out because of child support, how many employers are going to hire them based on that felony? Likewise, with a credit report, if you have a negative credit report because of child support reporting, there, a lot of employers will do a background, a credit check on you. So what employers on your in your area are going to hire you? They have to consider this stuff. Uh, prevailing earnings level. What, what's the earning level in your area? Other relevant background factors in the case. They have to look at that individually. They have to stop treating everybody's case like it's the same. Everybody's case is not the same. And that's the big problem. It's not a child support is not a one size fits all. It should not be a program like that. If, if it's going to be effect, in effect, it has to be individualized to that parent, to that family, to that child. But we can't do that if they're only concentrating on money. Okay. <clears throat> notice regarding the critical question. The non-custodial parent must be provided with clear notice that his or her ability to pay constitutes the critical question in a civil contempt action or violation proceeding. The warning on these petitions has been enhanced to include language provided clear 
providing clear notice to the non-custodial parent that his or her ability to pay constitutes these critical questions. So there have been questions asked about Turner versus Rogers and whether those provisions apply to non-Title IV-D cases, which is non-welfare cases, and do they apply if the custodial parent hires a private attorney? Do those safeguards, do those protections to due process, do they still apply? I have looked, okay, I've looked all over to see where, if there was any mention in this court ruling by the Supreme Court that it doesn't apply. So I'm gonna tell you what the Office of Child Support Enforcement, why the question's even coming up, whether it goes for non-welfare cases. According to the Federal Office of Child Support Enforcement, the Supreme Court in Turner specifically left unresolved the question of what due process protections may be required where one, the other parent or the state is represented by an attorney, the unpaid two, the unpaid arrears are owed to the state under the assignment of child support rights. That means that it's a welfare case. So that's automatically in. I don't get that. But um, and number three, the case is unusually complex. What is the criteria to an unusually complex case? You see how they use that language, trying to weasel, and I'm gonna say weasel, their way out of accountability. Now, the, the Supreme Court didn't say, okay, Turner versus Rogers, you have to do this A, B, C, D, and E, except if it's just not there, the language is not there. The Federal Office of Child Support Enforcement put that language in there. So I want to go through and let's reiterate the child support, I mean, I'm sorry, the Supreme Court reiterate the well-established constitutional principle that parents cannot be incarcerated for failure to pay child support simply because they are poor. They can't. It, has, it has nothing to do with if it's a welfare case, if it's not a welfare case, if it, it, it just doesn't have anything to do with it. Secondly, before a judge can incarcerate a parent for non-payment of support, the judge must find that the parent has the ability to pay the amount due. Thank you, Quentin. I'm going over here real quick. Okay, Brandon, let me know. Just send me an email and I'll see if I can help you. It's cshustle, the number one at gmail.com. Okay. So the Supreme Court was careful to limit the decision in the facts of Turner's case because this is what they said, why they limited. The money was owed to the custodial parent and she was also self-represented. Represented. No government attorney was present at the hearing. That's peculiar. The issues were not complex. He had been in jail, I think, five times by the time it went to the Supreme Court. How is that not complex? Mr. Turner did not suffer from a disability that would make it difficult for him to represent himself. If any of these factors are present, the court would need to appoint counsel. So it's a misconception about whether they have to appoint counsel to somebody in a contempt case. The Supreme Court held that they do not have to appoint counsel. Now, I put Turner in there and it explains everything. I'm not going to discuss that here um, because I'm talking about something specific, but it's in there. Okay. Unfortunately, that was decided there. If you can, please like and share this video. I appreciate it greatly. The court found that the South Carolina proceeding was unconstitutional because Mr. Turner did not have a lawyer and South Carolina did not have procedural safeguards in place to ensure that the process was fair. There's that fair word again. How many parents out there, non-custodial parents have went to court and had a fair hearing? Whether it was the contempt hearing, who has been treated fairly in child support enforcement at all? You, they treat you like a criminal as soon as you, your name comes up on the on the docket or when you get sent a letter. You can't even call and ask a question about your case without being treated like you've done something wrong. So fair, you're supposed to be treated fair, but how many people are? You know, 
It's a very biased system. So the notice to the parent in advance of a hearing that ability to pay will be, will be an issue. This is what they're supposed to be sending. A use of a form to elicit financial information. They have to ask about your financial situation before you are sent to jail. If they're sending you to jail without doing this, your rights are being violated. But they have to have the opportunity, offer the opportunity at the hearing for the parent to demonstrate that they do not have the ability to pay because, for example, the original order was set too high or because circumstances have changed, such as a loss of job, a rent increase, a medical emergency, or any anything like that that will cause a, that has caused a financial hardship. Okay, make them do their job. They want to pass the buck. They don't want to answer the phone. I'm talking about the local aid, the local child support workers, their caseworkers. They're supposed to treat you just like. They treat the non-custodial, I mean the custodial parent. If you have questions, they're supposed to answer the question on your case. If you have a change in circumstances, you have a right, they'll, they'll tell you, oh, you have to do it in three years. We, we don't have to modify your child support order. That's false. If you have a change in circumstance, like the ones I just mentioned, this is out of New York, um, they have to review your case and see if you qualify for a modification. If they deny it, appeal it, fight it, but make sure you keep that date handy so you can go back from when they denied you so they could so that arrears is, are still racking up because they refuse to grant your modification that you can try to get that resolved back to when you filed it yeah they are johnny they are they treat you like crap like you've done something and contrary to popular belief not everybody that has a child support order is on there because they don't take care of their children. There's a mandate that if you, if a custodial parent signs up for welfare benefits, they have to sue the other parent for child support. It's a, it's a mandate or they can't get any benefits. Even if they need whatever, some states make do it for food stamps. I wrote a blog about it because now they're trying to mandate that every parent, if they even apply for food stamps, that they have to sue the other parent. It's a hot mess. Okay, <clears throat> to satisfy the due process clause in the Constitution, procedural safeguards must be in place. Without them, no parent can be jailed for non-payment. This is from the Federal Office of Child Support Enforcement. This, that's, I'm reading this from there. Um, it's in the link. The link is in the comments. Okay, the court recognized in Turner that 70% of child support arrears are owed by parents with either no reported income or income of $10,000 or less. The ability to pay will be in question at most enforcement hearings and procedural safeguards are necessary to ensure that these hearings are constitutional. Constitutional. They can't ignore that. They try to, but we got to make them make them we got to hold them accountable. I lost my train of thought, but we have to hold them accountable. They try to ignore the Constitution, but enough is enough. So the question has been presented that Turner does not apply to cases that are not 40 cases, as I discussed before. How could Turner not apply to these cases when the child support system operates under Social Security Act? And even in non-40 non cases, the government is still involved in the case if they collect and distribute the child support money, they're involved. So equally debtor prisons, incarcerating someone based solely on the inability to pay a debt due to lack of money was outlawed in 1833. You can't tell today, if you don't have money, they'll put you in jail. Uh, you know, we have the bail bonds issue going on. It's just all the stuff, being poor, they're just criminalizing being poor and they started with this child support system. People said, okay, yay, lock them up, the deadbeats. And it's been going on since. Sorry. Oh, oh, okay, thank you. Babe. Okay, so I wanna talk about the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution, which guarantees that no, no, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, and property. 
or property without due process of the law. This applies to all states under the 14th Amendment, which, which states specifically, which specifically granted to all persons born or naturalized in the United States and guaranteed all citizens equal protections of the law. So we know, and I don't know if you read a blog I wrote, how the child support system violates equal protections. Just well, one thing, they don't treat married parents versus unmarried parents the same, just based on child support. They do not tell married people, married parents, you have to spend $500 a month on your children. They don't make them pay for college. They don't make married parents, they don't say you're married, but you have to pay for your kids' tuition. They don't do that, but they do that to non-married, unmarried parents. That's a clear violation. So I'm not going to get into that. That's a whole bit of another video. So procedural justice, according to the Department of Justice, refers to the idea of fairness in the procedure, I'm sorry, in the processes that resolve disputes and allocate resources. It is a concept that, concept that when embraced, promotes positive organizational change and bolsters better relationships. That's something that the Office of Child Support Enforcement is discussing. And that's in the newsletter. I put that in the references, okay? And finally, I want to talk about the DOJ letter that was deleted. Got the link up there. And according to the Supreme Court, they have repeatedly held that the government may not incarcerate an individual solely because of an inability to pay a fine or fee. Such a deprivation would be contrary to the fundamental fairness required by the 14th Amendment. The Supreme Court recently reaffirmed, this is when this letter came out, so they're talking about Turner, a holding that a court violates due process when it finds a parent in civil contempt and jails the parent for failure to pay child support without first inquiring into the parent's ability to pay, okay? Due process requires that such standards include both notice to the defendant that ability to pay is a critical issue and a meaningful opportunity for the defendant to be heard and the question of his or her financial circumstances. It all goes back to financial circumstances. This is what they have to do. So these are some of the issues that I want to discuss. I know that was long. Let me get a sip of water. And I apologize that I had to take a break so I could read your comments. I know now that I have to have like my phone or my tablet so I can see the comments while I'm while I'm on live. But thank you to everybody that liked or commented, shared, hit, click the share button. If um, let me look at the comments now. Yeah, I know art has been like that. And we've been out here fighting, um, and we're gonna continue fighting because that's what we have to do or this is going to continue to happen. Thank you, D. Thank you for your support. Okay, so thank you for your time and thank you always for your continued support. If you want to get the book, The Child Support Hustle, or you want to get a t-shirt having gray and black, you can order them from the website, thechildsupporthustle.com. I want to say right now, I do not, my organization does not charge for the information that we provide. Um, if somebody is saying that they are part of the Child Support Hustle and, uh, or you see somebody offering services or anything like that and saying that they're affiliating, they're asking you for money for some kind of forms, documents, whatever, that's not anything that I'm affiliated with. Um, we do not charge for the information that we provide. If we can help you, we will, um, free of charge. We do ask for donations because we do, um, we're always fighting for reform. We do town halls. We travel we're just in Alabama for our second child, child support town hall, hustle town hall. So, um, we're going to be in Michigan pretty soon. So, um, other than that, and if you buy a t-shirt or my book, all the proceeds are reinvested back into the Reform Child Support Now movement. So if they, and I put a post up like this before because I don't like people getting taken advantage of, thinking that there's a quick way to get out of the child support, you know, like, I'm not going to go into detail, but just know that if I'm affiliated with somebody, you'll see me 
promoting their stuff or you'll see us together. But other than that, I don't, if somebody's charging you guys money for, like I said, information, then they're probably not affiliated with me or the child support hustle. So I need to put that out there. And please do your due diligence before you give your money to somebody thinking that, um, thank you, Chuck. I'm going to keep fighting. I sure will. I'm going to come to Chicago. Let me know when to set it up. Set it up. We will be there. Um, so I want to tell you, I just wanted to say that without going into too much, too much detail, but we've been here for a while. You guys who know or have been supportive of uh, the Child Support Hustle know these things. So anybody new that's coming on, just, just know that. And we try to advocate for the non-custodial parent, try to bring information, give you some links. Um, if you have questions, you can send us an email, cshustle1.com. You can send us a message here. If you have a case that you want us to take a look at, maybe advocate for you, we have a new client form that is on our website, thechildsupporthustle.com. You can complete that. And if we can help you, we will. We're not going to charge you for information. I'll say that again. So if anybody's saying, well, the child, I'm with the Child Support Hustle, and if you give me $200, I'll, they're not with me, and it's a fraud. It's a scam, okay? So that is going to conclude my long, long video, but... I can all I always want to stress about debtor prisons and the ability to pay so that we can make these states stop locking people up when they can't afford to pay a debt. That is illegal. We are not in the 1800s. Thank you, Johnny Bell. You're awesome as well. And okay, so I'm going to sign out. Remember. I had to change this thanks to my dad. He said the numbers are growing, so they can ignore hundreds, they can ignore thousands, but they cannot ignore millions. Let's go. Keep fighting. <laughs>